Welcome to Secrets from the Scene, a show for local musicians who want to improve their music, grow their audience, and learn about Minnesota's music scene. If you're interested in talking about all things music related and meeting interesting people from our local community, you're in the right place. Welcome to Secrets from the Scene. My name is Stephen Helvig and I'm your host. I'm a local producer here in the Twin Cities. And today I'm joined by my friend Chance York. Chance is a very multi-talented individual. I'm excited to have him here today. I'm gonna read his bio because there's a lot to go through here. Chance York is a Minneapolis-born writer, MC, and yoga teacher. Chance is also a leader in the integrative health and wellness space. He started his journey in our local music scene, performing with his bands, Crunchy Kids, and Eric Mason's Detail which brought a lot of attention to Chance as he launched as a solo act. He is open for notable acts such as Chance the Rapper, Dram, Saba, Chester Watson, and more. Chance is a standout figure in the Minneapolis music community, a rapper with dynamic lyricism in a variety of capacities. His lyrics have been described as deeply personal yet universal. There's a radiant positivity with no attempt to ignore the gloom. Chance has collaborated with celebrated Minneapolis producer Big Cats to create multiple projects, including his 2018 album Deep Dark Hope. A favorite track, Own Dope, can be heard in Showtime's hit series, The Shy. His work now ranges vastly as owner of Connected Wellness, LLC, including content creation, creative consulting, workshop facilitation, and piloting programs for youth and adults. He also directs the nonprofit program Peace in Practice, with the mission of creating nurturing yoga and mindfulness programs to serve BIPOC communities. Chance's radiant love for the practice is evident in his Yoga is for Everybody ethos. His style of teaching is fluid with precise and poetic cues that are informed by a number of modalities including Pilates, neuroscience, and physical therapy. His lessons are trauma-informed and continue to evolve as he currently attends Brown University's specialized program for mindfulness-based stress reduction. Chance is currently a yoga ambassador for Lululemon Minneapolis, and his off-the-mat practice has also earned him a regional Emmy Award as the host of the PBS web series Outside Chance. Another of Chance's projects, My Brother's Heel, Yoga for Black Men, was featured in OK Player, discussing the role of in-person community healing. And the list goes on. I'm happy to have Chance back in the studio with me today. Please welcome Chance York. I am my own dope. I make my own work. That was a mouthful, dude. Man. Uh, <laughs> it might be the longest bio yet. It <laughs> is a long bio, man. We got to work on just trimming that up to some bullet points. <laughs> yeah, I probably could have um, could have maybe summarized a little better, but uh, hey, man. At the they're, same they're time, all want... notable. It's notable stuff. Exactly. Well, you know, the focus right now for you is is all the health and wellness stuff that's been going on in in your career. But I also wanted to to highlight how much stuff you've done in the music scene too because obviously this podcast is focused on local musicians. So I feel like that's like, we got to get that out because it's been a few years since your last release. Was that 2018, the 2018, last album? So, yeah. you know, you've, you've pivoted more towards the health and wellness stuff. But I think today's conversation is going to be so helpful for people because you know what it's like to put in a decade or more of, you almost know, two. almost two yeah. of going hard in the music business and what that does for health and wellness. <laughs> so I think it'd be cool to let you kind of give the background, the highlights, maybe anything that I missed too, but your roots start in music, right? And so take us back to the early days and you don't, I mean, you don't have to hit every detail, but yeah. walk us through what what your experience as a musician was first up to the point where you transitioned into health and wellness stuff. I'm actually just kind of excited to see what comes up because when you're saying the beginning, the beginning was me and my friends would smoke weed and just drive around freestyle rapping to whatever beat CD somebody burned recently. (laughs) And we'd have, who knows, probably some 
ludicrous instrumentals or like three six mafia or i don't even like i'm just trying to recall but that was really my start was um recognizing that i could just come up with stuff and that was very therapeutic and fun and funny and like i kind of became known for that my whole group of friends we were just freestyle we weren't good or anything but we sure liked doing it so people liked being around it from that i guess my first time on like an official stage was 2001 or 2002 i can't recall somewhere in that area there was a really thriving hip-hop battle scene this was prior to the movie eight mile but it was a very similar ideas people would go head to head over you know, rap instrumental and you'd get a minute to and you'd go back and forth. And that yeah, was, yeah. that was like the thing. And, um, you know, at first I'm like, Oh, I can freestyle, <laughs> you know, like I came naively onto the scene and just got smoked. My first battle just got, you know, humiliated off stage, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> re realizing that I wasn't just like driving around in my car with my buddies, a really dear friend of mine, who I didn't know at the time, we've become good friends of in the past 23 years or whatever, Big Zach, who was a, already a pretty established local hip hop guy. But the scene started to grow so quickly. After my first battle, they'd ho hold it once a month. It was like every third Monday of the month or something like that. But like the first month, there was maybe, you know, 16 rappers. And, you know, shortly after that, within two or three months, the place was full. There was a line around the block. All the different rappers, all their crews would show up. And there was, you know, everybody representing from Rhyme Sayers, Cats to, you know, Abstract Pack. And, you know, I met rappers like Meta Soda at those and Buddha Thai and Big Quarters, Medium Zach and Brandon All Day. And that was like my first introduction to the music scene i'm like all these people have fans and like cds that are sold at best buy and stuff i was very green and um i started winning you know like i'd still lose mostly but i would, I started winning and i just kept coming back so over the course of like a year people you know remembered me and i was making friends and, and people just people embraced me you know like big zach I remember Big Zach giving me dap the one time that I went like all the way to the the quarterfinal or the semifinal or whatever. I beat some pretty prominent acts at the time, and uh, one of which was one of the rhyme sayers, Gene Pool, who's like was was one of Slug's homies. He had a crew called Dino Spectrum, and just like beating an established artist did a whole lot for like my credibility or whatever. Right. That was really my start in music, just battling. Never won one. I think the furthest I ever got was the, the semifinal, like the top four of 32 rappers. But I got used to being on stage. People started remembering my name. I started finding out people who were actually doing stuff Yeah, and um, recognizing there was a really popping scene in, in Minnesota. You know, that in turn kind of led to my first band, which is how I met you, Yeah, Parallax. I was going to school in Mankato. One of my friends had a drum set. He knew a guy with a bass that liked to sing and that bassist brought over a guitarist and we were just jamming and they were making beats and I was freestyling and started writing some bars down and we started you know, making songs. And 2005 led to a our first record, I'd, I'd studied abroad that semester. We started this band, and then I left and moved to Ecuador for a semester of college. Oh, wow. And I came back, and we are like, we need to make a record. So we made <laughs> We went to a studio. It's like some converted garage outside of Mankato, like some rural area. Spent a day in the studio and made a project called the Ecuador Project. And it was just like a handful of the songs we had together at the time, then I was a recording artist, you know? And basically, <laughs> I was still just freestyling. There's like a handful of written things, but there was just a lot of, you know, made up lyrics. That was what I was, that's what I was doing. Parallax was immediately pretty successful just because we like had a, a party scene in Mankato. There was, you know, maybe not too big of a music scene at the time. So we were able to like become really established just because we could do something that could really entertain a crowd. We won some Battle of the Bands. We did did some stuff that kind of made a splash. And then our second project was called Nice. And it was just a collection of the songs that we had compiled. And we came here to 
yeah. at the time, Drop Tone Studios. We brought about 30 friends to have a party in, in the room, like on the soundstage with us. And we recorded the whole album live and that became nice. Yeah. Um, so the third album where we were like aiming for a more polished studio sound, still just kind of some ragtag kids trying to figure stuff out. We just had a whole lot of momentum or like headstrongness, naivete pretty much. But we made an album called When It Rains, It Snows and happened to have publicists that were interested in taking us on. And several of those songs wound up on some major network TV shows, notably The Kardashians and The Real World. So we were getting some royalty checks and like really f feeling like the sky is the limit. Like we can really do this. Like this is possible, you know, just some knuckleheads. We were able to use some of that money, buy a, a Winnebago as our tour bus and literally DIY'd our first several tours, just like messaging venues and artists and stuff on MySpace. Mm -hmm. and booked entire tours around the country, which were in DIY. So there was, there was great moments. There was terrifying moments. Like we were really just like road pirates, like just hoping to make enough, sell enough merch to like have enough gas to get to the next guaranteed paycheck or whatever. Oh, yeah. It was very, we were very out there, but we were just, you know, committed. We didn't have anything to lose really. And that was very fruitful but challenging hard ate a lot of taco bell and like you know lunch meat sandwiches and didn't get a lot of sleep drank a lot of like four loco and P <laughs> pbr and stuff like as one does be, uh, onto that health and wellness tip this was this is when i can pinpoint where stuff was totally wrong with my uh with my wellness but that band, the formation of that band, led to a kind of retinkering of the idea and the, and the personnel involved. We started our second group based with three of the members of Parallax and Eric Mason, and that started Crunchy Kids. And Crunchy Kids was, I would say, was pretty much an immediate success. So 2010, Parallax had its last show, sold out show at the Fine Line with More Than Lights. Mm -hmm. Um and then the following month, Crunchy Kids had its first show and accepted very quickly, mostly off of like the sheer genius of Eric Mason being into people are like, who is this guy? So that that started the Crunchy Kids era. Crunchy Kids did several projects, had lots of, you know, milestones, very still DIY. We were never we were our own label. We were putting out records, we were mm -hmm. collaborating with producers like Big Cats and, you know, at the time called Waterbury, Studi Waterbury Studios, which is now River Rock Studios. But we were just creating and tinkering and surviving around that pivot from Parallax to Crunchy Kids is when I found out that I was going to be a father and had a kid on the way. So the idea of just like road pirating around in a Winnebago with, with four of my homies, <laughs> um, it was no longer that appealing. It's like, I need a home and like a, some stability for a kid. You know, sure. I just started thinking differently right around the time that Crunchy Kids came about. So I don't know if I'm rambling, but that brings us to roughly, you know, the, the 2010s, yep. 20 teens. Crunchy Kids did a lot of very cool stuff and we started new ideas because moving with a band is just extra logistics, you know, extra people to pay all that stuff. And I've found that there was a demand just for, you know, the verses I was spitting and had some promoters really interested in me creating a, a solo set. I could just, you know, drop my beats on a DJ and, and rap and they could book me like that. Mm -hmm. So that led to Fed and Famished, my first EP with Eric Mason, a fellow crunchy kid who also produced beats. And we made that project and I started getting booked as a solo act. And then I started thinking about how do I make records as a solo act mm -hmm. and what could that lead to? Yeah, like you said in the bio, that led to two projects with Big Cats, who's a, an inspiration for like how to make beats that bang that are also kind of eerie and thought provoking and profound. It was more ma mainstream in my opinion, it wasn't, wasn't at all mainstream, but it was more mainstream than the music that crunchy kids or parallax had ever made and uh i just really wanted to like 
have a message that was still like entertaining or fun to listen to. Yeah, definitely. Well, that is a, a fairly good summary of of all the different projects and bands. And I know that there's even more in there in terms of collaborations and one-off things. And, you know, I know that there's a lot more, but that gives people a good insight into the amount of experience you've done. You've had performing, touring, doing everything that a local musician does, right? You've been through all of it. So somewhere along the way, you know, yoga and mindfulness start becoming important to you and start becoming a practice that you do. And then obviously that grows and becomes more and more of a focus. When did that transition happen and how did it happen? Mm. Yeah, so I first practiced yoga as a college freshman. So prior to ever being in a battle rap, I'd read the pocket edition of Yoga for Dummies. And (laughs) my motives were superficial, I'd say. I'd somewhere along the line picked up some correlation between like enhanced sexual performance and yoga you know like there's <laughs> something about like tantra or kama sutra and i was like yoga i'm like that's that's good for stroking so that was my motives i was a college freshman i was like yoga for dummies i practiced it i knew there was something really powerful there i understood like the breath and everything but you just I would, immediately felt the benefit is what you're saying yeah but i didn't have any type of dedicated practice or community or prioritization of it it was just a thing that I knew was cool. But when you're young, like you can get away with a lot of stuff in your body without feeling any type of repercussions. So I was, I started smoking cigarettes when I was like 15 years old, you know, like I was probably had substance abuse issues from then on, you know. So yeah. what was the real big transition was somewhere around 2016. I remember I'd done a solo set, it was my first solo set or as me and mason performing one of my records first to have main room I was opening for dead prez who is you know the ones that say it's bigger than hip hop mm-hmm. those guys are big yogis and uh wellness professionals and they've always been very self-aware so this was the second or third time that i've hung out with the guys in the previous hangouts i remember being like inebriated and be like i'm trying to get like you guys you know like you know and you know, by the third time of like hanging out with them and saying that and still being like inebriated, I was like, you know what? I'm actually full of shit. You know, like I keep on talking about what I'm going to do. And, um, but this coincided with kind of really, you know, this 2016 era, 2015, 2016, a lot of political division, a lot of, you know, stuff in the news, you know, Mike Brown, and then there's Philando Castile. And there's just a lot of things that were making me feel depressed about the world. And, you know, I had two kids. I was living in a condo in Edina, and it was like small and cramped. And, and, you know, just so many things made me feel like really insecure, which led to all of a sudden some unprecedented, like, depression where I was joyless. I couldn't find joy in anything really. I was like, this is scary. I'm like, I don't know. I'm like, I don't know what to do. So midlife crisis or midlife, you know, experience or or whatever it was, I recognized all the shit had caught up with me, you know, all the substance abuse and partying and ego and bullshit had like wound up abruptly on my head. (laughs) And I was like, holy crap, I don't know what to do. I don't know. I've never been in this state. Is this just, you know, permanent? Like, am I stuck here? Mm-hmm. Is my life over, you know, in my mid to early 30s? So that was a, a huge wake-up call. I can't remember, like, I can't remember ex- the exact chronology of, you know, it's all happened in a matter of like a month or two where just big things were happening and I could not deal with it. And I didn't know what to do. Kind of serendipitously a book that I had sitting on my bookshelf had like come off the bookshelf the kids were playing with it or whatever and it was just like sitting on my coffee table I'm like what book is this and I like read the back of it and it was like for life's challenges and trying time and it was just like it's like what the hell is this I'm like (laughs) I need to read this book and you know after just reading like the first chapter I'm like oh it's a yoga book I like yoga I'm like yoga is really yoga is really powerful. I'm like, why did I never really think of that? So there's a guided meditation in the book and it was focused on like 
feeling the light in your body and, and visualizing what you want and like all types of things that I realized I hadn't done. I'd fallen into a state of kind of downward spiral thinking, like worst case scenario in everything, which is, you know, very similar to anybody with like an anxiety disorder or something that was just like, I couldn't think of anything but worst case scenarios. And I was yeah. like, and I'd been stuck there for like a couple months. And I knew I didn't want to like try to drink my problems away or something. I knew that was not the route, but kind of just like raw dogging it it's really challenging. Like, you know, smoking weed was giving me paranoia and drinking numbed it, but I knew that wasn't a sustainable route. So I was just in a, in like a limbo, had two young kids. I had, you know, responsibilities. I had a fairly successful music career. I had stuff going on, but I couldn't see any clear future. And that gave, and, and I also saw this rising political divide and like, hatred in the forefront and all of that that was yeah. all weighing heavily and then you know people that look like me that literally have mutual friends i didn't know philando but i have mutual friends that did know philando well and they're grieving and i watched the murder on facebook live and he had his you know like toddler daughter in mm -hmm. the back and i'm like that could be me you know that it that's me like i feel um very unsafe in this world so that meditation made me realize I need to spend some time really focusing on what I want. And in doing that, I was like, this is working. And I was thinking about what do I want? And I started thinking clearly about what my goals were. And, you know, I'm like, I need to move into a better place. I need a career that fills my soul instead of drains my soul. And I need more time to do exactly this, which is reflecting on what's important. And, you know, once again, just like serendipitously, I met a guy following, so I was playing the uh, Basilica Block Party with Eric Mason's Detail, which is uh, another group that I was in, and alongside an amazing artist, V. Boheme. And she was actually, after that show, I was hanging out with her and met up with Dem Atlas, and we were just kind of decompressing. This was the week that Philando died. She was like, you guys, you guys need to meet my teacher. And I knew she taught, taught yoga and I was always really, ever since meeting her, I knew she was like a radiant light. Like she was a very, mm. she was a very strong light and connected to source or whatever. And I was like, hell yeah, I'll, I'll meet whoever she's talking about. And um, met this guy, Matt Portwood. He's a South Side dude. He, he graduated with Big Zach, who I talked about from, from the mm -hmm. battles, you know. And we had mutual friends and stuff. And this guy had been teaching yoga for 20 years. And he was like, you should be teaching yoga. And I was like, what? I was like, <laughs> like, I could do that? Like, I could teach yoga? Yeah. And um, he was like, yeah, we have a, a training certification training coming up this fall. Like, you could sign up and he could be certified to teach before the end of the year. And I was like, no way. I was like, that. everything made a whole lot of sense fast forward like a couple months to the fall when it would actually start and i'm like i don't have money for this i don't think i have time for this i don't even think this is gonna work out you know i was still very much on the fence yeah and whatever the case on that tuesday night the first night of practice i had no plans of going there at all but like got in an argument with my girlfriend and i was like i'm not gonna stay home and like left mad and was like just driving aimlessly and i'm like oh actually I can go check out this this yoga teacher training and uh in that basically like state where I was like activated from being in an argument and everything I, I I'm walking up to this yoga studio on the south side called Radiant Life or got kind of uptown area and uh it's called Radiant Life and Matt wasn't there but his business partner at the time Jaina Portwood was leading the class and I'd never seen her never heard of her or anything she just came up to me and gave me the most like amazing hug that just made my whole nervous system like calm down and she's like i'm so glad you're here and i was like me too <laughs> like this is <laughs> it's definitely the spot so i ended up staying in the training and um by december of that year i was certified to teach and i had this space like this practice space with crunchy kids that i was using that had a gymnasium on it <laughs> and i'm like like, hey, most of y'all don't know this, but I'm now a certified yoga teacher. And if you want to come practice with me, holding donation-based classes at our, our practice spot. And they, right off the bat, the classes were like full. 
even though I was not that great of a teacher at the time. So it's like sure. just people being like, I don't know about yoga, but I like that guy. So come and hang out with that guy, you know? And, uh, you know, the classes were like crazy long and like I was, you know, like trying to fit everything I'd learned into like every class and like they're popular for a time and just kind of like dwindled off. And then I just had to get good at teaching and then they all started growing sure. again. Yeah, so basically from 2016 until now, I've had steady yoga classes in a variety of settings and communities. But it really became like full-time, you know, like full-time wellness, yoga, mindfulness and during the pandemic. There was no more shows. There's no, my creative stuff that used to have me making songs and albums, I couldn't see a future where there was live shows. <laughs> and I was <laughs> like, I don't write songs just for records. I write songs to perform in front of crowds and the pandemic had me, you know, uncertain about the future. So all of my creative time and practices went to creating mindfulness and yoga content. Which has definitely paid off. It's, it's a good choice. Yeah. Yeah, that pivot has been inspiring to watch, you know. I've known you for many, many years and like 15, 14, <laughs> 15 years. And followed along online, of course, and uh, you know would run into it shows and that sort of thing and from an outside perspective who, you know, I, I don't know the whole story by any means, but I could just see the highlights, right? But it also made a lot of sense because there is such an an intersection between music and wellness. And I want to dive into that specifically because for local musicians specifically, we, we get into this because we're chasing how music makes us feel, mm -hmm. right? There's such a payoff to doing it, an emotional connection and a, a feeling, a spiritual feeling for people that it brings. But at the same time, the anxiety that can come from pursuing it as a career can completely eliminate <laughs> that feeling very quickly. So it feels like a natural thing, right, to pursue those fields, but yet a lot of people don't. Like being able to, to manage the pressure of being self-employed in the music business and that sort of thing. And the music business is uniquely positioned as being full of like some pitfalls, pit pitfalls and, mm -hmm. and just unique challenges that you don't find elsewhere. And then on top of all of that, a lot of artists are already dealing with mental health issues. So where does somebody begin if they want to follow in, in that journey, not necessarily to become a yoga teacher, but to just be more self-aware and be healthier? Yeah. I mean, so it comes down to self-care, self-awareness, self-love, self-work. It comes from within, you know, like I'm glad you touched on that. The spiritual side of making music, there's a lot that's entirely therapeutic about and me as a lyricist where I can write about the heavy shit that's on my mind and find that it connects with other people and stuff like that. There's something very healing about that. And then being on in a crowd where, you know, the energy you're controlling or like influencing the energy in a very big way with the lights and, and the sound and the sound system and people moving and setting a vibe like that is very therapeutic. It's very healing to have a bunch of, a room full of people on a similar wavelength. So recognizing the healing and spiritual power of music is is essential to being being a musician. I say it has everything to do with your relationship to yourself. The most authentic music comes when you're not making it to please somebody else. You know, like hmm. make music that serves your needs because it's all about doing something in a way that makes you want to do it again. And if you do it too often with the intention of like, I'm, I just want a big hit. I just want to connect with everybody. I, I just want everybody to you know see me as this person or whatever it's too daunting and too big we're not in control of how other people perceive our music but if you can make music that really connects to what feeds your spirit what makes you feel whole by putting it out the accolades or the crowd appreciation comes after that so creating good habits of making music that is meaningful to you that makes you want to do it again because everything is habit if you're just doing it like, oh man, if this album doesn't work out, I'm done for good, you know, like which a lot of people get into that mindset. Don't do it for the response. Don't do art in general for fame. There's much better ways to make money than doing music. There's much more, <laughs> much more consistent, dependable ways to make to that. make money, right? And and so getting it mixed up as like, I need to pay these bills and I do that by making music, so I'm gonna make music to pay the bills. 
is very different than tapping into I make music because I have to make music because that is that's what feeds my soul or you know alleviates the the burden of life or or whatever whatever other reason besides making yeah, yeah. money right so being aware of yourself is the first step to understanding like what are your motives like what why do you make music what kind of music are you making mm. what's your message what you know what's the lot how how can you do this for a long time and continue to be inspired by it rather than being like oh the people didn't like this one therefore I'm done you know like yeah and and a lot of so there's a lot of motives why people get into stuff but being clear about like what are your motives if your motives are just making money that's that's great you know if and if it doesn't work out don't don't feel like like it's oh the Minnesota scene doesn't support local art you just see a lot of jaded ass musicians out there. Yeah because they didn't get the acclaim that they think they deserve. When you make great music and, and get the opportunity to, to share it with people, that's a gift, you know? Like the money and uh, sustainable income and stuff actually comes from having a good business mind, a good business plan, a good business team. Because I know a lot of great artists that can't make a living off of music because their music is too niche, like specific, that, you know, maybe there won't be enough, <laughs> like now with the internet, it's totally different. But I, I came up in a kind of, you know, where there's still CDs and tapes and like yeah. handbills, flyers and stuff. So really being clear about what you're, what you're making and why can help you connect to your audience by having that clarity. But really make music to make music, not to make money. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's, that's always got to be a place where you start. I want to touch on a couple points here. First is that you saying like, well, being self-aware is kind of where it begins. And I think a part of that is going back to something you said earlier when you stumbled across the book in your house was realizing, well, I need time to do this. I need time for reflection. And I feel like that's kind of tied in equally with that first step is giving yourself time for reflection, which is in a lot of ways, giving yourself time for some silence and not just filling your life with distractions constantly because it can be substance again a lot of a lot of artists struggle with that but it can also just be being on social media all the time or you know listening to podcasts constantly watching movies constantly all that stuff don't get me wrong there is so much great content that can help you in your career so just curate things that are worth your time and even at the end of that like cut out some time for just some silence. Just let your brain work on its own for a second and see what comes up so that there's space for reflection. And then that can actually lead you down that path of creative. Yeah. Yeah. To create. I, I totally agree, man. I think I mentioned it before. We're, we're really creatures of habit. Like a lot of your life is taking place unaware to you. You know, like we're we're really unaware of a lot of our thoughts, a lot of our feelings, and a lot of our actions. They're happening because they have happened before, and our life really is our habits playing out. So taking that time to really pay attention to like, what are my habits? Like, what is going on in my head? Like, what story am I telling myself in regard to this, mm. you know, this thing? And that takes time, you know, that takes a practice. Yeah. And that practice can become a habit if you prioritize making it a practice. And it very much helps being to be a creative if you if you make that space. Everybody, no matter what industry they're in, this day and age are distracted. You know, like there's like all the distractions in the world are right in your pocket at any given time. You know, if you got if you got a signal, you can be on the internet and you can piss away your attention day after day in the routines, even like you're saying, it might seem productive, you know, like you can be scrolling social media or watching podcasts or, and, and learning and everything. And it can be related to what, to what you're growing, but ultimately having that space to reflect is essential. And that can even be, you know, there's, there's, uh, there's music that can do that, you know, like there's drone music, there's, you know, all types of, sound bath type thing. There's, yeah. there's all types of stuff that can give you that space. Even making music like that can be very therapeutic. But I think like, I, I like what you're saying about making space and prioritizing the value of that space because it's not all about productivity 
Yeah. Like in our life, it's we think it's like, how much output can we make? Can we produce? Can we produce? Can we produce? All of that comes down to being connected to the source. What is your essential self when you strip away all the resume and you know all of the to-do list? Like, who are you? What does that mean? And that's a constantly, that's an organically changing, evolving part of being alive. And if you're not checking in on yourself, you might wind up in a midlife crisis type situation where every habit that you have does not bring you closer to what feeds your soul or like what what actually energizes, inspires you, you know? And like, that's common. You know, you have a, a outdated program that you're playing out and all of a sudden you intuitively feel everything is off, you know? Like, yeah. And that's why, you know, sometimes you got, you know, guys in their later years, like, dating super young chicks or having to drive a sports, you know, all the typical midlife crisis type stuff mm -hmm. is like the reality of who we are is not lining up with the habits that we're still playing out. So that type of reflection is essential for an artist because like you might have been inspired to make a certain type of music for a certain thing at a certain part of your life. And that might have grown and changed and you just didn't notice because your habits yeah. keep on doing the same thing, you know, and going the same route. Yeah. So it, it is a very, you know, when I say spiritual practice, it's getting to know your true self beyond, you know, what you've done already and beyond, you know, what, what you do habitually. It's being able to reflect and say, hey, this, this actually doesn't serve me. This belief, this story, this element of my identity, yeah. you know, these habits, these vices, like this doesn't bring me closer to what, like, I need. And things change and evolve over time. So that is why you have to make it a practice because you might have been perfectly aligned with where you were at at 22. But then by the time 27 hits, things can look very differently. You know, kids, family, yeah. whatever other financial burdens in your life. And I like the line of, you know, what story am I telling myself? Because everybody is telling themselves some story. And that's a part of how we function in the world. And so just checking in on, well, what is my story right now? What, <laughs> what do what I- What feeds my soul? Yeah. Like, what is, what, who am I? You know, like that's a real deep evolving question yeah. that should be asked every day. So on that kind of the, the other thing I wanted to touch on was, okay, you've made time to reflect. You're feeling more in touch with, with your authentic self and maybe your authentic art. And so great, but- that also still poses a challenge for those of us that pursue something like music or yoga that we love, that's our art, that's a part of our healing, and we also make it a career, yeah. right? Because it's one thing to say, like, don't do it for the money, do, but you know. But what if you do? what if you do? <laughs> right. Uh -huh. <laughs> one thing that I, I admire about you from an outside perspective is I feel like a strength of yours is how authentic your message is and the programs that you do, the people that you help, all of that feels very much like the person that I know. But at the same time, I'm sure there's unique challenges because of that, between balancing that and just making this a living. <laughs> yeah, man. It's very interesting. Like, I feel like my, um, I get, booked to make a lot more music. I haven't put out a record damn near six years and I'm still getting booked to like play shows, you know, like more than ever really, which is like pressing me to make a, a record. But so the, the question was basically like, how do you make a living off it and keep it authentic? How do you, yeah. How do you protect that authenticity yeah, yeah. while you're still trying to make money? Yeah. Well, see, I would, I would say the idea of, Having a, a part-time job that might be unrelated, that keeps the lights on or a roof over your head and like your basic hierarchy of needs being met, mm -hmm. because it really is about longevity. If you're going to build anything that matters, it's a garden, you know? Like you're, if you're continually mm. planting seeds, you have to nourish those seeds. You can't rush it. People rush it for a lot of reasons sign a record deal or whatever, but then you're basically stepping on somebody else's platform that they can remove from you just as easily. My success has been in, in just building organically and I don't ever ha have to come out of my integrity or be somebody that I'm not. 
but that takes time, you know? And like, I've had all types of complimentary or supplemental income throughout those things. You know, I was getting my master's degree to become a teacher because I was like, I need a job with health benefits and stuff. But then I, you know, my final semester of my master's program, I was like, no, I don't, I don't want to do this actually. I worked uh, serving tables. I was working at a sushi restaurant right up until the pandemic. But the idea is, can you do something that can keep the lights on, that can cover your basic needs, but still leave you the amount of time and energy that it takes to continue planting and nourishing those seeds? So like to make the leap into full-time musician and just be like, here we go. I've done it many times and still had to backtrack back to like, well, you know, if the mortgage doesn't get paid, I'm going to have a bunch of homeless kids and that's not going to make me very inspired to make music, you know, yeah. like, and that's, and that's a big thing is like the more pressure you have just to live and make money off the music, that's a different type of motive. You know, like if you're like, I got to survive off this stuff and that might work for some people. I'm thinking of like early Eminem stuff where like he was broke and he was in, inspired to like make this music and it like really translated well. Most people are just broke and don't make them make it yeah. big immediately. And so and you generally don't hear their stories. Yeah, right. And you don't hear you don't hear their story. So the idea is take care of yourself first because if you have a healthy safe place to explore inward and tinker and be experimental and and try new things and fail without it meaning like you're now out on the street and have a, a hundred times more challenges that you have to overcome. Those are all barriers to creativity. You know, mm. like you, being safe is going to be a staple in in my opinion. You know, like I said, some sometimes that insecurity in the in the in the have to make it type shit, sometimes it works for people because that's that's the only way that they can do it. But I, I believe I've seen a lot more people wind up really fucked up in the game because of taking that leap without understanding the, the time and investment or understanding that it really is business. You can be a very talented artist and not get paid enough to make a living. You can be super talented. And I mean, my homie Eric Mason is one of those people. He's one of the most talented people I know, but didn't really want to play the, the business game. And was like, and, and you know, we had a lot, a lot of conversations about that, you know, like he pivoted to a completely different career and now loves making music again because it's not, it, it's not a job, you know, it's a passion. Yeah. So I don't know. I think a part-time job is a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> to, to sum it all up, it's like take care of your basic needs because if you don't do that, those just become barriers to authentic creativity. Yeah. Obviously, some people stumble into some big opportunities that allow you to just be full-time and continue down that path, but that's rare. It's far more common that it's going to be a long-term, many, many year journey of incremental building, growth. Yeah, of building these careers. Mm -hmm. And I think that ultimately there's nothing wrong with saying one step back, two steps forward. And it might feel if you're pursuing your career that, oh, if I'm not doing this full time, I'm not really taking it seriously. But that's not true. I think in a lot of ways, that's just an, an a necessary one step back of like, no, I got to give enough of my time to my safety and, and my energy too. I, well, I'm saying too, it's like uh, working a 40 hour highly demanding job that doesn't leave a lot of room for creativity. I think like you get home from work and you're just like, you know, like you might not have the energy or the drive or whatever. So it really is finding a balance of like, Hey, can I have my basic needs met so I can sleep at night? And have enough time and energy to create meaning, you know, meaningful stuff. And that includes networking, yeah. going out and checking out shows and listening to podcasts and stuff. And that is demanding, you know, like that. But this comes down to the, the two currencies that I talk about all the time, especially in, in the wellness industry. We know time is money. Like we, that's already cooked into our, our society. Like time is money. It's cooked into our language. Like we talk about time like it's money. Well, I spent an hour on that paper that flat tire cost me an hour or something you know like yeah. we talk about time like it's money but we don't often realize the other thing the other currency that is equally as important if not more important sometimes is the other thing we pay which is our attention you know wherever you're paying your attention 
and spending your time, that's the sum of your life. You know, so investing it in, in places, you know, where you invest your time and attention is ultimately the most important thing that we can understand because there are all types of attention vampires out there, be it in people in relationships, be it in social media, be it in the, the chemical abuse and, and the, the chasing of ego and, and, the, and they're, you know, faking and fronting and, and all that stuff. That takes a lot of time and attention, and, it, and it's really just kind of like pissing it away. When you're taking your time and attention and investing it into something like your inner garden, you know, like figuring out who you are, checking in on yourself, that's an investment that pays you back with more time and more attention. And I, and I say that, it might confuse people, like how do you have more time and more attention if you slow down? There's research that shows meditation dilates time. People that practice have the ability to slow the perception of time down. And, and for a example, it's like, how easy is it to scroll Instagram for an hour? <laughs> it's easy. It's very easy. It's like, where did the last hour go? It's very easy. But say, try sitting up tall and, and breathing for five minutes, be the longest five minutes you've ever spent because of your, your perception of time changes when when you do something that's uncomfortable, unfamiliar, and it's really kind of like heavy lifting, and it also gives you the ability to focus single-pointedly your attention on things instead of being distracted by everything and being mm -hmm. like, oh, I have a clear vision. What? What's that? Oh, yeah. You know, like the idea of, of, of keeping a clear focus and finding that inner vision and connecting to it in, within you and letting it radiate from you that's how meaningful things happen. You know, like the world that you see around you is the fruit of seeds that you're nourishing then. Mm. And I have one little example that might be relevant. You know, back when, when Lizzo was coming up, I recall being in the green room. We're all dicking around. We're, it's, it's sound check. We're already like me and my guys are already like getting fucked up. And like Lizzo was just chilling on her laptop working on video edits, she's still working, right? And like her mentality was always, she was famous before she was famous. She moved like she was famous. She believed she was famous. She like, she had much bigger plans for herself mm. than any of us immediately around her. You know, we're just like, hey, we fucking made it, man. We're in the green room at First Ave and all the beer's free, you know, like. And she was still working because her vision for herself was growing outward. You know, like she knew it. She was clear about what was going on and the world just hadn't realized it yet. So when she like she started getting the big moves and started getting like famous, famous, it wasn't a surprise to me at all because she had already, she was already in a different place mm. inside than any of us had reached. Wow. And that's really what stuff is about. The clearer your vision is, the, the, the seeds that you plant and the seeds that you water and nourish grow into the fruit, the reality around you. You know, so like now where I'm at in life, people are like, how did you get there? You know, like, how, did, how, do, you, how do you have all these opportunities? How do you get to do that? You know, and like for me, looking back, it's a clear progression of incremental steps. It's like, I know I, I can remember how I met somebody. I can remember what opportunity led to another opportunity. But when I'm standing there and it happening, I don't know where the fuck it's going to go. Sure. And, and that kind of trust in the universe or that releasing of expectation and just loving the work, you know, like if you fall in love with the labor, the fruit comes abundantly on its own, you know? So like that idea of like, oh, why does nobody like my shit? Oh, Minnesota music scene doesn't support anybody. You know, like instead of getting mad about that, recognizing that like whatever you're growing, it is up to you first to prioritize it, to clarify it, to nourish it, to nurture it. And it grows out from you because we have all these opportunities to meet people. Anytime you, if you get the opportunity to get on stage, if you get the opportunity to record something or play for a friend or whatever, Every time that you do it, that you are able to let your vision out into the world, embody your vision, it creates ripples that continue out into the universe yeah. in, in a very magic way. So like my current place in life is like, it's a dream that I thought of 
long ago, you know, even though every single day I might still have to wrestle with thoughts of like, am I doing enough? Comparing myself to somebody else and, and so on. And that's an ongoing process of being satisfied with where you're at and continuing to pour in to and nourish and nurture what matters to you because those opportunities continue coming when you become known as the person that that is for that thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have two other quick questions about this interconnection between music, yoga, health, and wellness. How has your music background affected your yoga teaching? Let's start there. Greatly. I have a huge network of people I know because they've seen me on stage, because they've okay. had a party with me, because we've done drugs together, you know, whatever, <laughs> whatever the thing, you know, like I know a lot of people because I've been out here for so long and I've always been doing, even if they didn't like my music, like hanging out with me and so on. So I have a, a wide network of people that has accumulated in the 20 something years I've been a professional musician. That led to, like I said, right when I started teaching yoga, I had people that were like, I'll learn from you. You know, like, mm. I don't know about yoga, but I know about you. And you know, I still have a large network and I had the ability to operate social media and be an entrepreneur and create content mm. and all of the things that I learned, you know, shooting music videos or HTML code on my MySpace page or whatever, <laughs> you know, like the music business is all business. If you're learning how to be your, your, an entrepreneur, be your own business, you have to be able to do a lot of things. Yeah. And I think that a lot of that translated into independent yoga teacher, wellness professional content creator. All was a very smooth transition. All of those skills played off of each other. But as somebody who has hours, lots of hours on stage in front of crowds, rapping, speaking, dancing, moving, all that stuff makes me a very good yoga teacher because it's, it's even less pressure. I can get in front of a crowd and, you know, command the, the attention and help people into a more you know, peaceful or whatever type of setting that they're trying to create. But I can hold space well enough for people to, to look inward, which definitely was developed on stage mm -hmm. or in front of a camera or all of that. So kind of sidebar here, before the pandemic, I was already very, I understood that I wanted to start making content, yoga, mindfulness type content, because I can only be in one place at a time, but I could reach so many more people if I could make a, a video or good audio guided meditation or whatever. So I had interest in doing that already prior to the pandemic. And I'd read a book about habits and it, it said, you know, you have to create opportunities to practice the skills that you want to get better at. I wanted to get better on camera. So I, I, when the pandemic hit, I saw that as an opportunity to get better on camera because I'm just sitting in my backyard or whatever. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just live stream. I'm going to go, I'm going to go live on Facebook every day, you know, lead some yoga or guide a meditation or just talk about what's going on. I did that. I called it live at five. And every day for like a hundred days, I just went live and was teaching yoga and was creating meditations and, and talking about my take on when the whole George Floyd uprising, all of that was happening during this time that I'm going live. And it, it accumulated a pretty large following and, and an awareness of like, you know, yoga can be for everybody. You can be sitting in your backyard doing these simple things or whatever, different breath work or different postures or what, whatever. That led to so many opportunities. I mean, the the live at five, not only just like galvanize the music fans that I had and everything like this guy really teaches yoga like he's really about this shit and these insights are really authentic and like connect with with what who's who he's always been but you know also just some insight into it so that led to you know some contract work I was doing for the YMCA they created the uh virtual YMCA for me and a handful of other teachers and we started creating content live streaming like every day and PBS had, so for Eric Mason's detail, Eric was the subject of a Minnesota original, like this series of where they highlight musicians or whatever. So I was in a, a shoot with them back in like 2017, 2018. But fast forward to the pandemic, the producer that used to produce Minnesota originals, they're like, well, we have this new series called Pandemic Performances. 
And like, we really want you to be a guest on that. We just send a crew to your house. You perform, you know, on your deck or mm -hmm. your backyard or whatever. And uh, I did that and spending time with that producer that I first met on the shoot with Eric Mason's detail. He was really just feeling the, the you know, the, the reflections that I had about wellness and relationship to yourself and we're in my flower garden. Like, you know, it wasn't much longer, you know, maybe a couple months later, they came back to me with a pitch for a series for me to host. And they're like, you know, we want to re-envision what an outdoor Minnesota show looks like. And we think, you know, everything that you're talking about with the wellness and the this and that, we think you'd be a great host. Like, would you shoot a pilot? So I was like, yeah, let's do that. And uh, that pilot became the show Outside Chance. And our first season, we won a regional Emmy. And that was, you know, that's that outside affirmation or whatever, that accreditation where it's like, whoa, like we're actually doing this thing. Like I didn't set out to like get awarded for doing the mm -hmm. work. I just thought it was fun, interesting, important, aligned work. So I did it. And um, yeah, season two, we got really good at making that show, which just led to more and more things. I was hired by a large corporate wellness company called Well Beats that are based out of Minnesota to create content for them, which led to a vast national and international audience on their platform. So it all comes back to music, you know, like, I, I, like yeah. there's no separating the development opportunities, relationships, network that was created as a musician that just naturally translated. And um, I don't know if you have a, another question about the the current work that <laughs> that I'm doing too. But well, my my follow up question I think will lead you to that, which is how has yoga influenced your music? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it is just an ongoing thing. Curating playlists for yoga classes makes me listen to music for the feel of it, which makes for a love for music of all different genres and stuff. Like, hey, if mm. this feels good, would this feel good? And meditation would this feel good in a fiery type of fitnessy yoga class or, or whatever but just getting into sound healing sounds like singing bowls and stuff like that there's such a huge overlap through all all of these connections and opportunities i've become faculty on the university of minnesota's center for spirituality and healing and they explore a lot of that, the science and research be behind what music actually does to the nervous system, what holding spaces for crowds for partic to participate in sounds and sound healing and movement healing, what can come from that. So now I, I get to be involved and in part of the core activation team or the creative team in a project called Waking the Oracle. It is a combination of music and movement and improv and holding space for those reflective healing experiences. And I'm lucky enough to get to recruit Eric Mason. <laughs> so we're, we're back doing rehearsals and stuff <laughs> like full circle from all the, yeah. from all the wild, you know, the wild times into like these, these times where it's all about community healing. Yeah. And uh, I feel totally blessed. Well, this whole conversation has been awesome. I think very rewarding, you know, Obviously, we touched on all the, the benefits of giving yourself some time for reflection, checking in with yourself, self-care, and how that can really affect your career. But also just, you know, your journey is a nice reminder, too, of how just consistently showing up and being in your scene, being supportive. I know every time I run into you, you're out, out at a show supporting somebody else, you know, how that pays dividends, how planting those seeds and taking care of of the people around you will ultimately improve your own life as well. So thank you for all of that. One thing that I've been doing at the end of every episode is, you know, asking people to reflect back on, on their journey. And like, when I was telling you about this podcast, I said, well, it's free. It's for me and you 15 years ago. <laughs> like, you know. <laughs> so with that in mind, is there, you know, a secret that you want to share with your former self if you had the ability, something that you would tell them looking into it that would help them out? I mean, it'd probably just be echoing the theme. The theme of the thing is 
things. Take care of yourself. When you're young, you just feel invincible. I can eat Taco Bell three times a day. You know, I can drink all night and pop up and, you know, still be able to do whatever is asked of me. But that stuff, it doesn't last long. But those habits die hard. So be mindful of your habits. Take care of yourself. I, I mean, that just sums it up, really. Yeah. Well, I definitely want to have this conversation again, maybe in another year or so. It was great to have you on. If people want to, you know, connect with you online or, you know, attend one of your events, and how, how should people uh, follow along? Yeah, great question. I'd say I'm most active on Instagram, Chance Connected, no spaces. And yeah, you can email me at the same Chance Connected at Gmail. I have all types of, of offerings as far as public yoga classes. I do a, a webinar, you know, about twice a season for the University of Minnesota. It's free to attend. There's usually hundreds of people that, that attend online and it's, it's intro to some mindfulness, either chair yoga or laying yoga or standing yoga, highly accessible, highly educational. Those are really cool. You can stream both seasons of Outside Chance just by typing it in, Outside Chance PBS on YouTube or most of the streaming services. Yeah, I think that's it. What else do we talk about? What about, what about this Awakening the Oracle? Yeah, yeah. So Awakening the Oracle, we're going to have, I don't know how quickly this turnaround is, but we have, we're having an online event that's... Um, it's, it'll be me guiding a meditation with uh, some sound healing that's, that's online and that's in March. But you can find that if you type in Waking the Oracle and U of M, or you can find the Center for Spirituality and Healing, just Google searching it and Waking the Oracle is the name of the project. And we have an activation at the Weissman Museum and we have two actually in April. So those are open to the public. You can come in. It might be a little bit weird. <laughs> there might be some, might be some dancing, some moving, some singing, some improvisation, some costumes, some props. You, who knows what you're gonna see? But definitely, it's in the realm of what's called neuro art, which is music or or creative experiences meant to tone the nervous system, to create safe spaces of healing and reflection. That's so interesting. Well, very cool. I'm going to put all those links in the show notes, uh, as well as uh, my own contact information. You know, if you've listened to this episode and you enjoyed the conversation, I'd love to hear from you. Any feedback is always helpful, especially in the early days here of creating stuff. So if you like this conversation, reach out, send us a message. You can email me. All the, all the connections will be in the show notes. Chance, it's good to catch up, man. Thank you so much for being here. Man, thanks for having me. Secrets from the scene, man. <laughs> Heh <laughs>